I've never seen it. I do have cough drops. And while I usually don't chew gum or anything in my mouth, I think I'm going to have to this morning. Mark, thank you for bailing me out there. Wish we had you mic'd, cause, uh, but we really didn't have to because you're booming. So I was going um, I was gonna begin by, by asking what's one of the worst feelings in life, and I, um, I think I just found it, um, being in front of a bunch of people and not being able to say anything. So, um, But I knew this morning was going to be a, a little struggle. I just didn't realize it was going to be that struggle. Um, but one of the worst feelings in life, I believe, besides not being able to say anything when you're in front of people, is waiting. Anybody like waiting? No, no. It's the worst. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know about you, but there's, there's a, there's a lot of things I don't like waiting for. We'll just start out with the first thing, grocery store lines. Okay. Um, Particularly, we're talking about Walmart because um, they're the worst. But just grocery store lines, uh, I'm going to be the guy that as I'm coming up, I'm done with my shopping. I'm going to be analyzing uh, which line has the most people in it, which worker is doing the best job of getting the stuff through, and I'm going to choose that line. Um, what about Amazon packages? Enough of this two-day shipping thing. What about one-day shipping and uh, same-day shipping? Um, and those two-day shippings, I don't know if you noticed, it's kind of slipping. They're slipping. Um, what about text? Why aren't some of you, uh, why is it your phone, like, physically attached to your hand so that you can automatically reply at the moment that a text is given? I'm just the only one. Okay, it's fine. drive throughs I mean, we could go on and on and on about places where you have to wait and for things that you have to wait. How many of you know how hard it is? to wait, especially, especially when you're waiting on God. You, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you have been waiting a long time and you've been praying for something. God, I'm praying, I'm believing, I'm believing, and I'm asking that you, um, you know, you bring me a, sp a spouse. I, I want to get married. Or you've been praying and you've been waiting on God to, to help in your marriage. God, please do something. I need your help. Or you've been asking God, praying maybe to get pregnant or, or to heal your depression or get out of debt. Some of you, you've been waiting on God for so long, you wonder if God is even listening. Does he even care? Is he even there? If you've ever felt like God is taking too long, I want you to know this morning that Jesus understands. Today, we're resting with the question, why is God so slow? And I just want to begin with, with a word of prayer. Father, we just ask that you, Lord, that we, as we wait on you, would you just build our trust and our faith in you? knowing that you are a good God who loves us and your timing is always perfect and you're always good. So help us to put our faith in you. We pray today in the name, the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. So we're in a message series called Been There. And I, I want to say, for the most part, if you've experienced any kind of, of pain, whatever pain you might be facing, whatever challenge you've ever faced, Jesus has most likely been there. If you hate waiting on God, God, why is it taking so long? Jesus has actually been there. And I'm going to show you how exactly he was waiting on God. And I can't get into the mind of Jesus, but. You can imagine if he was the son of God, which he was the son of God in the flesh, and he was that from uh, birth, child, everything. He would have known that his mission was to come and to seek and to save the lost, to give his life as a ransom, to pay the price, to save us from the penalty of our sins, that he came to give his life so that you and I might have life abundant. And yet he had to wait 30 years years, 30 years 
to begin his public ministry. 30 years. I mean, listen, if I'm watching a show on Hulu or wherever and it buffers for three seconds, I'm watching another show. 30 years. 30 years before he ever got the green light to do the very thing he was sent to do. And so if you ever found yourself like obsessing over time or impatient, obsessing over uh, time, you aren't the only one. It's really interesting. If you look at the Gospel of John, um, you'll see the Gospel writer use the word time over and over and over again. 35 different times John mentions the word time. Seven different times he actually quotes Jesus as talking about a specific hour or the time that would come. In other words, Jesus said a few times, my time has not yet come, or my hour has not yet come. And then another time he would say, my hour has almost come. And then Jesus finally said, my time or my hour has come. In fact, I'm going to show you an example in John 2. Um, If you got your Bibles, you can open it up. Um, John 2, very beginning of the chapter, verses 1 through, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. It's the story when Jesus turns water into wine. There's a joke there. I'm just not going to make it. Okay. And so in John's gospel, um, John 2, verses 1 through 3, the text tells us this. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, Mary, right? And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, this, I know this looks like a statement, but this is not a statement. This is a a command. She is saying, do something about this. And the reason why I know this, God, I can't, it's because I'm married. All right, husbands, back me up. Come on. Come on. Come on, husbands. Come on. Uh Because your spouse will say something that sounds like a statement, but it's not really. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They say, (laughs) come on. They say a statement like, the trash is full. What they mean is, do something about the trash. And so Jesus' mother's getting into Jesus' business, and she said, the wine, they're running out of wine. And then verse 4, woman, why do you involve me? Now, I'm going to just say this. Let me just say this. I'm going to advise you gentlemen, perhaps, not to speak like this when you receive a statement that is actually a command, okay? No, see, what she's, no, listen, this is what Jesus says, woman, that's, that's how he said it, that's how he said it. So, woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied, the hour, the hour, the hour has not yet come. <laughs> I'll do it later, I'll do it later. In other words, it's not God's timing for me yet, Jesus says. I'm waiting until God says go. Again, that's not going to work for you, gentlemen. So there are four different times in the Gospel of John where Jesus says, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. Listen, it's really hard when you know that God can and God doesn't. And if you are even just like a normal Christian, honest enough to put past like study school answers, sometimes you just go, where's God? Why isn't he doing anything about this? Why is God, what, what is God doing while I'm waiting? And I want to try to answer that for you this morning uh, using scripture. And what is God doing while you're waiting? The good news is that while you are waiting, God is working. 
While you're waiting and trusting on God, Scripture says he's active in ways that we may not even know. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah 64, verse 4 says, Since ancient times, your translations may say, before the world began. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. While you are waiting, God is working. Well, then the question comes, why is God taking so long? Why isn't God doing what I know he can do? I'm praying for my husband, but he's still not nice. I'm asking God to take my depression away, but I'm still dealing with depression. I'm praying, God, I know you can take these migraines away, but why are they still here? God, why is it taking so long? Well, maybe he's working on it, and he's not ready yet. Or maybe you're not ready yet. Maybe God's working on you. What I found is that a lot of times when I ask God, why won't you give me what I want and why won't you give it to me now? There's almost times where I feel like God is saying, you can't handle it yet. You can't handle it yet. Some of you are praying and you're praying for something like, God, give me some more money, give me some more money, give me some more money, 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 money. And God's like, you can't handle what I've given you. How about you learn to handle what I've given you and maybe I'll give you some more. Well, God, give me some more influence. I want to have more influence in my community, in my family, in my, I want to have more in my job. Give me some more influence. Give me some more influence. And God's saying, I'm going to grow your character before I'm going to grow your influence. I don't want your talent to take you somewhere where your character can't keep you. You hear me? I don't want your talent to take you somewhere where your character can't keep you. Just this week, there was another announcement about another Christian leader, big Christian leader who had a moral failing. Because they're super talented, they're super gifted, but their character did not match their talent. God may say, I want to mature you. I want to do something in you. He may be teaching you right now while you're waiting to just trust in him. If he just if he just gave everything that you wanted right now the way you want it, guess what? You and I, we just keep on going. And maybe he's teaching us to depend on him in a way that we wouldn't otherwise. He's doing something in you. So what I found is that sometimes God does something in you before he does something through you. Or he does something in you before he does something for you. And you see all sorts of examples in scriptures, but you know, you, you, you know, Saul, Saul, you know, the guy that hated Christians and killed Christians and imprisoned Christians and then had this supernatural encounter with uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus and was blinded by the light and goes from Saul to Paul. And, and, and Paul's like, I want to, I want to, I want to preach the good news. I want to share the gospel with everybody. And I want to, I want to go and, and depending on the commentaries and scholars that you, that you read, some say it was about a decade, maybe longer, that he was building tents while God was building his character or building the word in him before he could fully use his gift. Maybe a decade before he was ready to go. God says, I need to do something in you first. What's God doing while you're waiting? God's always working while you're waiting. From the beginning of time, no eye has seen, no ear has heard about all that God does, how he's working for those who wait on him. So what do we do while we wait? What do we do while we're waiting on God? Well, since you know God's working, don't waste the waiting. Don't waste the waiting. A waiting season isn't a wasted season if you continue to seek and to push into God. So don't wait passively. What does a waiter at a restaurant do? They serve. 
So in other words, let's be serving while we wait. Let's be growing while we wait. Let's not wait passively. Let's wait actively and press in to God. It's never easy, never, ever easy. But don't just wait passively, wait actively and faithfully. Maybe do something or some things that help you grow closer to God. And what I want to do this morning is I want to, I want to maybe show you something that hopefully will, will build your faith in God as you're waiting. I'm going to give you a little history lesson. Everybody get all excited about the history lesson that's about to occur. You see, all the way from the beginning of creation to the birth of Christ, God's people have been waiting for the Messiah, the Savior, the one who could come rescue his people and restore God's people to himself. Over again, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming. And he hadn't come, and he hadn't come, and he hadn't become. Why is God taking so long? And though they didn't know it then, we know now that the world was not ready yet. The world wasn't ready. And so I want to tell you about a time called the intertestamental. Te- mm, I knew I was going to mess it up. I tried so hard, guys. Intertestamental period. I said it, I'm not saying it again. It is the gap between the book of Malachi and the appearance of John the Baptist. And that period is about 400 years. So for 400 years or so, no prophet spoke on behalf of God. Which was brutal. Because before that time, while they were waiting on the Messiah and waiting on the Messiah and waiting on the Messiah, they still had prophets speaking on God's behalf. And then suddenly there was like nothing. Kind of a familiar 400 period of, of, of God's people in slavery in Egypt where they probably thought God's forgotten about us. God's left us. Maybe, maybe how you're feeling right now, you've been praying, you've been praying, you've been believing, you've been believing, pursuing God trying to keep pressing into God, but it feels like God's gone silent. It just feels like it's dark and there's nothing there. You're just asking for a sign, Lord, give me a sign, anything, like a verse, a a, a feeling, a, a song on the radio, like whatever, Lord, just give me something. And it just feels like that God is silent. I just want to remind you that just because God feels silent doesn't mean that God is absent. Just because God feels silent doesn't mean that he's absent. While you're waiting, he's still working. He is still the God of the universe. He's working behind the scenes to bring about all good to all those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So while you're waiting, he is working. And what's he doing? Well, the world was waiting on a Messiah during this 400 uh, period gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he simply wouldn't come. And then We read our passage this morning, Galatians 4. Mark, you did great, and I'm going to read it again. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. But when the set time had fully come, at just the right time, when the time was perfect, God sent his son. There was a time when you were under the law and the law served as a guardian. But now through faith in Jesus, because the perfect time has arrived, God sent Christ. And now if you put your faith in Christ, you become his son or daughter. The perfect time has arrived. And so God sent his son. So I'm going to give you three things that happened during this 400 year period where there was no prophet. There's more, but I'm just going to give you these three. During that 400-year period, number one, there was the Socratic method. You're like, what? It was a new way of learning. Instead of the didactic method where there was a direct teaching of truth, for now you were invited to ask questions. For the first time in history, people were encouraged, students were encouraged to ask questions. Number two, Throughout all of history, the Old Testament had been written in Hebrew until maybe 280 B.C. 
So number two, the Old Testament is translated into Greek during this 400 year period. The third thing which happened, world altering, is that Alexander the Great conquered the world. So what does that mean? It now means that there's a common language. Everyone spoke a little Greek. You hear me? So during that time, there was something known as the diaspora, where the Jews were forbidden to live in Jerusalem. So they spread all over the world. And Rome was developing roads and highways throughout the empire. So therefore, during this 400-year period where there was no prophet of God speaking, while they were waiting, God was working. And for the first time in history, we see these three things. The first thing is that people were encouraged to ask questions. And guess what? God sent the answer. His name is Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And the second thing is that everybody now has access to the Bible in a language that they can understand. And number three, for the first time in history, the good news could spread throughout the world in a common language through his people, the Jews, who were spread out all over the world. Come on, y'all. While they were waiting for the Messiah, God was working. Setting things up for the spread of the gospel when the time was just right. Not early, not late, but perfect, in perfect time. In perfect time, God sent his son, born of a virgin, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Not to come for the healthy, but for the sick. Not to come for those who uh, call themselves righteous, but to come for those who are broken in sin. When the time was right, when the time was just right, God sent his son. So that you and I could become sons and daughters of God. So if you're struggling with waiting, I get it. I absolutely get it. You're asking God to answer you in prayer. When will my child come to Christ? When will I get a job with benefits? When will when will you do something in my marriage to get us out of this pain? When can I get a real house or a car that actually runs? I mean, whatever it is, you're waiting. I just want to remind you that just because he's he feels silent does not mean that he's absent. What I promise you is our, our, our God is a good God. He loves you and he's not ignoring you. He's not neglecting you. He has not forgotten you. Maybe it's not ready yet. Maybe God's working on it. Or maybe you are not ready yet and that God's still working on you. Or maybe... This is what I really don't want to tell you this morning. Or maybe, maybe God's never going to do what you're asking him to do. Because he's still God. And it's not about our preferences. It's all about his glory. Scripture says this, in fact, Isaiah Prophet Isaiah again, chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. If you're waiting, God is working, and maybe he's working on it, maybe he's working on you, or maybe he's not ever going to do exactly what you want him to do, because he is not there to serve our wishes. We are here to serve him and to glorify him. And we have to remember that we serve God and not the other way around. Going back to Jesus, he knew this and he lived it. Jesus started by saying, it's not my time yet. The hour has not come. And then he moves to the hour has almost come. And then he said, the time has come. 
And when it did come, it was not for Jesus' benefit. You hear me? When the time came, it was not for Jesus' benefit, meaning what God called him to do was not something Jesus, in his own physical desire of comfort, not something he wanted to do at all. Jesus says this in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then verse 27 and 28. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Look, I don't know what you've been waiting on. And I don't know how long you've been waiting. But I do know that God's timing is perfect. Do I understand it? Absolutely not. But I do know that God is always working. He's either working on it or working on you and me. And I know that when God feels silent, he is not absent. So in our waiting, in your waiting, what can you do to press into God, to draw near to him? What can you do to be ready when God does answer your prayer? I'm so glad we serve a Savior who's been there. A Savior who was sent at just the right time. So that you and I, who put our faith in him, could be called sons and daughters of God. Remember, I love you. God loves you. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do not like to wait. And some of us have been waiting a long time. Or Father, some of us have been waiting for what feels like a long time, but to you, it's but a glimmer. So Father, would you, would you help us to restore our faith, our trust in you, Remind us that you are not absent. You are a God that is working. And you're working right now. Weaving things together that we can't even fathom. Lord, would you help us to ask and to be in prayer for things that are in line with your will and not ours? And then just help us to wait. And in our waiting, would you help us to press into you? Lord, whether it's getting into your word or, or, or just simply praying and listening to you, would you help us do that? Lord, we're so thankful that at just the right time you sent your son. And then even today, even today, if we put our faith and trust in you, we can be called a son and daughter of yours. Lord, what a gift that is. We thank you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.